thanks a lot for coming. Um, we have a small but very uh, high-profile audience here to discuss Europe and Latin America. Um, I'll start, known intuitively, talking about the United States, because of course in Latin America when you talk about pretty much anything on international relations, you have to talk about the United States, usually to blame it for all the mistakes, uh, but I'm not doing that, I'm not blaming anyone, uh, just to compare um, the relationship that Latin America has with both sides of this thing called the West, the Western society. Um, so relations between the U.S. And, and Latin America have been traditionally marked by deep suspicions um, about the northern neighbor's interests and posture on the global stage. U.S. presence in Latin America regional summits such, such as those of the OAS usually end with um, uncom uncomfortable exchanges and divisions. So in comparison to the, other, uh, to the often turbulent links uh, between these two uh, hemispheric giants, um, Europe has often appeared as a more natural partner, suffering less of geopolitical suspicions and accusations from extreme left-wing rhetoric. There is a perception among many Latin American governments and academics that Europe uh, has its foreign policies more attuned with multilateral spirit of a world with emerging powers. When we take Brazil's ambitious foreign policy goals, for instance, uh, we see that it, it has found more acceptance among European allies, uh, which were more willing to support its bid for the UN Security Council, for instance, than the US. Yet the numbers um, not always agree with this qualitative analysis of uh, similarities. Trade between Latin America and Europe and the European Union account for 6% of the European Union's total exports. This number might not be the latest and more accurate, but I'm sure Mar Maruk will correct me if I'm wrong. Imports are also at a similar low level. Trade talks have been famously uh, long and, and protracted. Uh, Mercosur, for instance, has been discussing trade, uh, trade with uh, the European Union for, uh, well, since the 1999. Um, and European support to the resolution of strategic crises under the responsibility to protect principle has uh, attracted some ambiguous reactions and sometimes open opposition from Latin American countries, especially the Latin American uh, rising powers such as Brazil. Cooperation on the common threat of transnational crime also seems at times to be slower than the shift in activities and flows of criminality by non-state groups. Differences and delays such as these are sometimes um, some of the challenges that we will discuss here today uh, with the help of um, my speakers here. Dr. Maruk Doctor is a senior lecturer in political economy at the University of Ho, interested in political economy of Brazil and regionalism in Latin America. Dr. Bettina Trueb is manager at the Explore program at the European Union Latin American and Caribbean Foundation, ULAC Foundation, based in Hamburg. So, uh, if we can start with Maruk, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. I'm very pleased to have been invited to speak. Thank you, Antonio. Thank you to the Institute, of course, too. Uh, today, I'm going to have putting on another hat in some sense, because normally my work comes from the Latin American perspective. And today, I'm trying to, given the topic, trying to actually look at it, look at Latin America through a European or European Union perspective. Uh, I shall throw out more provocations than specific information and I'm very happy to people to pick up on the issues that actually they want to discuss in more detail in the questions. Now the EU strategies for Latin America have changed very noticeably since the uh, 2008 financial crisis and here I'm thinking specifically of strategies in the economic realm but of course with a lot of uh, political uh, and strategic aspects also falling in place. Whereas the European strategies previously used to uh, emphasize, strongly emphasize, normative aspects, and uh, for example, related to democratic governance, to uh, building uh, uh, institutions, social cohesion, human rights, you know, the usual uh, normative things the EU has talked about, and has always presented the EU as a model for regional integration, uh, pushing for inter-regional arrangements on this basis. More recently, however, the emphasis has been shifting towards material aspects related to economic interests, so growth, jobs, what is in it for us rather than for you uh, in these dialogues. A willingness to engage in bilateral relations uh, uh, and partnerships 
either through strategic partnerships with the bigger countries, and here Brazil and Mexico are, are, are key in Latin America, but also through free trade agreements with many of the smaller countries, and our Pacific-facing uh, countries are all involved in, with the EU in that manner. The talk will look at the opportunities and challenges facing EU relations in Latin America as a whole, but with a little more emphasis on Mercosur and Pacific Alliance as the two most intriguing in some sense and two different faces of this shift. Uh, I'll say a little on the EU context, then I'll go and talk about Latin American uh, partners uh, themselves, and then EU's opportunities in the region, and finally how all this fits into the current global context, specifically, of course, the rise of China and negotiations for the mega uh, preferential trade agreements, uh, which, are, which involve the US, <laughs> and hence we can never be too far away from it. So, the EU context. Academics have long uh, espoused notions of the EU as a normative power, a civilian power, even a transformative power, with a civilizing mission in the world. Now, all of you probably know that since the 1990s, the EU was actively promoting interregional or bi-regional processes with the goal of supporting its own preferred norms and values at the multilateral level, hoping to enhance its own identity as a global actor and to shape global governance. Uh, its interregional strategy involved a hub-and-spoke pattern with various uh, regions in uh, Africa, Asia, and Latin America. However, this interregionalism, although driven by one uh, uh, regional organization, did never, never led to identical patterns or identical institutions, regional organizations, because of the many specificities of the countries that they were dealing with. Uh, more surprisingly, however, is the fact that the EU itself did not seem to have a single coherent strategy with respect to these different regions and the interregionalism projects. Apart from the differences, more expected, uh, uh, in terms of the interests and levels of engagement of individual member countries, more puzzling in some sense, but of course very well known reasons for it, uh, was the difference within EU institutions, and sometimes not just between different institutions, but in the same institution. So, for example, the known differences between the Council of Ministers and the EU Commission very often, but more puzzlingly sometimes, or more understandably, depending how well you know how the EU functions, the Commission itself. So whether your issue lands in DG Trade, or DG External Relations, or DG Agriculture and Rural Development, or oh, that's a hellish area for Latin America, uh, it will really make a difference as to how your interests or how your dialogue is going to develop. And this becomes crucial from the Latin American point of view, understanding where the Europeans and the specific sub-institution in some way uh, and its particular views. Adding levels of complication, of course, post-Lisbon uh, Treaty have been the new arrangements and the new powers given to some older institutions. So the uh, President of the Council, the EU High Representative for Foreign Affairs and Security Policy, the European External Action Service, and then, of course, the extended powers given to the European Parliament on certain economic issues, including the, uh, uh, they can now ratify um, or veto <laughs> any agreements. So that's enough, I think, on the EU to set the context what we're dealing with here. In Latin America, the EU member states, of course, have long, historical, extensive relations with various countries in the region. Trade with the region has always been quite strong, and in the last decade, it has actually doubled. And look, we think of the last decade as one of stagnation and slow growth, but trade between EU and Latin America as a whole has doubled in the last 10 years. Uh, as uh, Antonio mentioned, it accounts for about 6.3% of total EU extra-regional trade and only about 2 and a little more percent of total EU trade. The other important aspect is, of course, foreign direct investment. 
foreign in direct investment stocks of EU firms in Latin America have outstripped and continue to outstrip foreign direct investment stocks of EU firms in Russia, <coughs> India, and China combined. Okay, so we are talking about very key investment interests in, uh, in Latin America, with again a long history, of course, uh, of these relations. In terms of development assistance, uh, in fact, uh, Latin America has had diminishing importance. Uh, uh, very few countries to receive uh, development assistance from uh, uh, Europe. I think in South America, it's only Bolivia and Paraguay. And the budget has been shrinking over the years. It was about 2.7 billion for the last uh, five-year period, roughly. Euros, 2.7 billion euros. So, who does the EU cooperate with and talk to apart from countries on an individual basis? There are many groups and subgroups available to them uh, for economic uh, cooperation and trade matters. Mercosur, the Andean community, um, the Central American Common Market, even for certain economic aspects, the Bolivarian Alliance, and finally, of course, most recently, the Pacific Alliance. The political dialogue aspects run alongside the groups and the bigger macro-regional organizations like UNASUR and CELAC. Uh, uh, UNASUR being the South Americans and CELAC being all Latin Americans, um, all Latin American nations. So, the EU, in some sense, is spoiled for choice. There are so many interlocutors, so many possible partners, and uh, sometimes it, it actually seems to find it hard to identify the right forum for its engagement in the region. And uh, here, I am going to talk about two such fora, uh, very important for the economic side of the relations, but has very important strategic and political aspects, too, that are uh, relevant and that is Mercosur and Pacific Alliance. I'll say a little on each of them. Now, the Mercosur uh, closely, its birth closely accompanied uh, in the European uh, Union, uh, has been in, and the European Union has been engaged in negotiating an inter-regional association agreement with Mercosur since the mid 1990s. There are three pillars for the negotiation, a political dialogue, economic cooperation, and a preferential trade agreement. The first two pillars have more or less all things sorted out, but they've been waiting for agreement on the trade front. Uh, negotiations stalled in 2004. They were relaunched in 2010. And recently, official comments suggest that the two are ready to exchange tariff offers uh, in the coming weeks, I mean, this has already been delayed in more than six months, but uh, every week it's the next week. So we have no date yet, but certainly there's growing pressure and interest because the outgoing presidents of the Commission as well as the Council really would like to be able to say they put their name to this document. But the EU also knows it can't push uh, uh, the, the Mercosur partners too much and there's certainly been a lot of foot dragging going on, especially on Argentina's part. Um, the uh, negotiations' uh, main problem, of course, is the trade liberalization aspect, and specifically the political sensitivities related to them. So on Mercosur side, it is uh, in uh, uh, manufactured goods and services, and uh, in... Um, on the EU side, it's of course agriculture. I should also point out that the EU, from the EU side point of view, of all the subgroups the EU does business with in Latin America, the only group in which it has a trade surplus is Mercosur. Okay, so this is another interesting uh, thing to keep in mind. The other point to keep in mind: in the last five years, uh, uh, average <coughs> annual growth in trade with Mercosur despite all these complications, has been over 14%, okay? So, uh, and this is much more than with uh, other Latin American uh, groups. Uh, equally important, however, to point out is that the average increase from the Mercosur point of view, uh, in other words, EU imports of Mercosur group, has only been around 4.5%. 
In other words, for Mercosur, holding out for the agricultural part of the deal is absolutely essential for them to feel that boost, that spurt, in, and to be able to justify the fact that they're going to reduce protection to um, uh, 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 industry. Uh, and this is absolutely central to understand the dynamic here. Another important impetus to agreement uh, is, of course, the changing external environment, and specifically the increasing competition both of them feel from China. And this has added, of course, a new uh, flavor in some sense to the discussions. I hope there's enough comments there to, to pick, uh, for you to uh, pick up on this. Um, the Pacific Alliance. Now, this is, of course, Latin America's newest regional organization. It was launched in 2011 and then formally established in June 2012. It has four members, Mexico, Colombia, Peru, and Chile, and two members in waiting, Costa Rica and Panama. And they have somehow managed to successfully brand themselves as a group that is market-driven, a motor of economic development as a historical breakthrough in regional integration in Latin America. Quite frankly, <laughs> I'm very cynical about any of these claims. I'm very skeptical if they have anything meaningful really to say. And given their heavy emphasis on the economic side, and I will talk about it in a few minutes, the economic achievements in terms of increased trade and investment are irrelevant. I would say, in fact, it is perhaps more interesting to look at the Pacific Alliance as a political or strategic soft balancing of Mercosur, of <laughs> who knows, somebody else. But who else? But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> so we will, we will maybe people have ideas on that. Of course, they have moved very quickly to create a, a, a sense of economic dynamism and progress. They've had many achievements in the very short time of their existence. Achievements, great and small. Uh, for example, uh, they have eliminated visa requirements for business travelers amongst them. They have academic mobility and student exchange. Of course, I love that. Uh, coordination of trade and investment promotion activities. They have an integrated uh, stock exchanges since 2011, although this, I believe, doesn't work very well. Uh, consultation uh, with the private sector is given a lot of emphasis. So there's the Pacific Alliance Business Council uh, and, you know, all kinds of measures for remo removing non-tariff barriers, trade facilitation, and so on. Most important, however, is that in February 2014, it established a free trade area amongst its members, uh, eliminating immediately tariffs on 92% uh, of goods traded uh, and with the goal of free movement of goods, services, capital, and people uh, in, in the foreseeable future, though no particular date. Although the Pacific Alliance focus is on coordinating, coordinating economic and commercial integration uh, to increase competitiveness and access to Asian markets, the reality is in fact that 50% of Pacific Alliance trade is with the United States. Also, intra-alliance trade is absolutely minuscule. Uh, in, uh, uh, Mexico, uh, only 3% of its trade goes to Pacific Alliance countries. Um, Chile, only 5% of its trade goes to Pacific Alliance countries. Uh, Colombia, which is the highest, is around 12%. So we are talking about almost no immediate sense of um, economic complementarities. There is n a really no appreciable level of uh, production integration. No, you know, it's meaningless to talk about things like global production chains in, the, in this context. This is not what the Pacific Alliance is about, even though it likes to market itself as such. Um, there is uh, very little uh, investment or trade flows among, uh, within the group. In fact, what is noticeable is that all four of the countries have free trade agreements with the United States as well as with Europe. Uh, and. Uh, Interestingly, not with Asian Pacific states, although this is the claimed main target of the efforts of this alliance. <coughs> uh, 
uh, initial economic studies show that it struggles with geographical distance, poor infrastructure, lack of economic complementarities. In fact, they are rivals in many areas. They have decided to go for a light institutional model with all intergovernmental, uh, only intergovernmental structures and relying heavily on pre presidential diplomacy. And uh, one can see with the change in Chilean government that the mood in the Pacific Alliance is already showing changes. We can talk about that if you like later. And ironically, all these things I've mentioned, you know, lack of complementarities, infrastructure problems, uh, intergovernmental structures, reliance on presidencies, are exactly the same issues that are blamed for the lack of regional integration in Mercosur. So, health alert and alarm, in fact, if you think this is going to be leading down the road to very much difference. Uh, how much time do I have left? Um, minus one minute, but okay. <laughs> don't so worry. I don't <laughs> I will move. <laughs> okay, what do don't, I do? Don't worry, you can have um, four minutes more if you want. Okay, uh, so on the face of it, then, what are the opportunities available to the EU? Uh, the Mercosur is certainly moved towards a more politicized agreement and is quite protectionist. Meanwhile, the alliance has promoted open, open regionalism, is supposed to be more market driven. But interestingly, as for the EU's old past, let's say, preferences, actually Mercosur should be the preferred one, in a, a, you know, a, an agreement that believes in, in a sort of EU idea in a normative way of integration. The uh, Pacific Alliance talks about deep uh, economic integration as one of its goals. How can there be deep integration in a free trade area? I mean. I do not understand uh, uh, this aspect. However, the uh, EU basically has decided that it will engage in uh, strategic partnerships with the emerging powers of the big Latin American states. It will use FTAs in its relations with the smaller ones. Uh, and while I think there's not much hope of a big jump in exchange, economic exchange between Europe and the Pacific Alliance, what I think it might trigger, very interestingly, is change in Mercosur. I think the Brazilians have sort of woken up mm. to the threat, in some sense, of this alternative uh, uh, image, in some sense, or organization in the region. It has, uh, Odo Patriota, when he was still uh, foreign minister, sort of dismissed it and played it down and said, oh, it's a marketing exercise. I think they know they have to start responding to the frustrations and dissatisfactions in their own in their own sort of camp. First dissatisfaction, of course, the smaller Mercosur economies, uh, Paraguay and Uruguay, have already uh, uh, gained uh, observer status in the Pacific Alliance, and more importantly. Brazilian business community has become a very vocal critic of the paralysis of Mercosur, uh, the increasing uh, isolation of Brazil from the activity, if you will, in global trade governance, and that activity is, of course, in the big mega uh, uh, agreements being discussed. And the Europeans, to, uh, and to conclude here, their priority is really the stagnation and multilateralism, the inability to in some way push the normative Europe uh, uh, image, uh, partly because of practical uh, economic uh, uh, necessity, has meant that it has decided to hitch its ride with, uh, or, or to sort of guarantee its ride in the transatlantic uh, trade and investment partnership negotiations. It would, after all, mean forging a stronger Western community in a multipolar world, a sort of economic NATO, as uh, Hillary Clinton said uh, about it, and that it would somehow use this as a common front, US, EU common front against China. And where does Latin America fit in all of this? And that becomes a very important question. Latin America, because it's not a big troublemaker region, often simply gets pushed aside, ignored. However, of course there are opportunities. Uh, can the deeper relations with Latin America, for example, increase the competitiveness of the two regions vis-a-vis -vis China? Can the Pacific Alliance serve as a bridge between the EU and the Asia-Pacific? Or in fact, as a bridge between Mercosur and the Asia-Pacific? 
can Mercosur offer another attractive alternative opportunity uh, for uh, investment, trade, growth, jobs? And can Latin America and Europe cooperate in arenas of global governance to build this effective multilateralism, which certainly Brazil, the main, let's say, regional power, has a great interest in? Thanks a lot, Maruk. Um, I think the, the, the question of Latin America being excluded from many of the, or, or perhaps left aside by many of the geopolitical initiatives uh, that involve the US and China is definitely correct. And we see that the Pacific Alliance as a potential geopolitical signal to the world that it is very different from Mercosur might already be happening with the way that they are uh, integrating or almost all, if I, I think all of the member countries are now integrating into the Trans-Pacific Partnership. And that is uh, signaling strongly to Brazil that they are so, I like this expression, strategic soft balancing away from Brazil. And perhaps we can read into Brazil, the Brazilian opposition's comments favorable to the Pacific Alliance, uh, perhaps a, a, an attempt of approximation um, of, this, of this model. Um, you, you ended with uh, multilateralism and the, and, and the negotiation and the uh, integration of this uh, talk between Europe and Latin America. And I'm sure that Bettina will be able to talk a little bit about that. Okay, so also first of all, thank you very much, Antonio, for inviting me to speak here. I'm really pleased to be here with the two of you today. Um, my talk is going to focus more on the sort of political um, developments in the European Union, Latin America, and Caribbean um, by regional relationship. Um, I'll start with a sort of quick overview of where the bioregional process comes from, um, what it's been like, what the current situation is, um, and then I'll discuss some, um, uh, some suggestions for um, really sort of redynamizing uh, the bioregional dialogue. So basically, um, EU involvement with Latin America as a region really began in the 1980s with um, involvement in finding solutions to the Central American conflict, um, cooperation with um, the extended Contadora group. Uh, were very important in that. And this evolved into the EU-Rio group dialogue. And in 1999, um, the first EU black bi-regional summit between all EU member states and all states of Latin America and the Caribbean took place. And that um, ended with a proclamation of a strategic partnership between the two regions. Um, However, since then, the strategic partnership has mainly been limited to um, biannual summits of heads of state and government. Um, at least that's the most visible part of the relationship. And the latest of those summits took place in Santiago de Chile in 2013. Um, and the next one will take place in June 2015 in Brussels. Um, what was special about the last summit was that it was the first summit that took place in the framework of an EU CELAC partnership um, with the creation of the community of Latin American and Caribbean states. Um, a few years ago, the EU has decided to accept CELAC um, as its regional interlocutor, so to speak. Um, my view on that is that really fundamentally that hasn't changed very much because CELAC is at the moment so weakly institutionalized um, that it really just, um, it, it's a change in name of the summit. It's really substantially, I don't think that much difference um, is made by, by CELAC as an institution. Um, what has happened ha is that the CELAC pro tempore rotating presidency has become the main interlocutor of the European External Action Service in doing the sort of follow-up between summits and deciding on what direction the thematic and um, focus of the next summit should go into. Um, what's astonishing about the um, bi-regional summit process is the breadth of issues that's being discussed at those summits. Um, I don't think there's any other region, any other world region or even indeed 
um, any other country perhaps with the exception of the United States with which the European Union is able to conduct such a rich dialogue. There's structured dialogues on migration, on drugs, um, on higher education, research and innovation. It's really, um, I think that's where parts of the key potential for the bi-regional relationship lie is in that you can discuss all those issues with Latin America perhaps in a different way than you can discuss them with other regions. Um, the bi-regional dialogue has also been heavily placed on this um, sort of rhetoric of um, shared values and I'm going dis to discuss that later on as um, actually one of the key impediments to um, a more successful bi-regional dialogue. Um, however, of course, the context has slightly changed since 1999. Um, and so what, you know, what has happened in the meantime? The in the meantime, the 1999 scenario was very optimistic for EU-LAC relations due to the consolidation of um, democracy in Latin America. Um, regional integration in that region experienced a boost in the 1990s with the creation of Mercosur and the institutional redesign of both the Andean community and um, the Central American integration process. And so it was thought from the EU side that really Latin America represented the ideal um, ground for experimentation in this interregional strategy that, um, that Maruk was also talking about. Um, in the 1990s, there was a lot of support on behalf of Latin American governments for free trade agreements, and it was within that context also that the negotiations with Mercosur were launched in 1999. Um, in 2014, what we have is a somewhat more pessimistic scenario um, for the interregional relationship. Um, the Mercosur negotiations, as Maruk has discussed, still haven't been com co concluded, um, and region-to-region -region agreements, as the EU envisaged them in the 1990s, have been much more difficult to conclude than has been anticipated. Um, in fact, only two region-to-region -region agreements have been concluded with the LAC region, and that's the um, Central American Agreement and um, the EPA with CARE Forum. Um, so basically that aspect has proven a lot more difficult than people thought in the 1990s. And at the same time, um, the EU is currently submerged in a deep crisis out of which economically it seems like it's slowly emerging but with a very damaged legitimacy of the European model, both internally, as we've seen in the last EP elections, um, but also externally. And Latin American countries are very closely observing what's happening within the EU. And of course, they're saying, well, you know, maybe the EU isn't such a sparkling model for us of, inter of economic integration and political integration after all because what we can very clearly see right now is that it's not working in the European Union either. Um, and that became very, very evident at the last EU CELAC summit in Santiago. Latin American countries have become um, a lot less enthusiastic about the European Union as a, as a model and as a partner. Um, at the same time, um, Latin America and the Caribbean, especially Latin America, is trying to emerge from being a sort of policy taker in the relationship um, to becoming more of a policy maker and it's no longer willing to be babied by, um, by others, by other external actors, including um, the European Union and in particular within the European Union, um, the two countries that have traditionally had the strongest relationships with Latin America, Spain and Portugal, are two of the countries which have been most affected by the crisis. So they're also, uh, they've lost considerable legitimacy and considerable drive in their own foreign policy um, towards that region. Um, at the same time, in both regions, we're observing a sort of diversification um, the EU's eastern enlargement has brought new priorities with it, especially um, towards the eastern neighborhood. 
Um, and it's also brought new problems with it that have captured EU attention to some uh, to some degree, especially as we've very recently seen um, things that have been happening in the relationship with Russia um, exemplified by the crisis in Ukraine. And at the same time, in Latin America and the Caribbean, there are now different models of political configuration and economic development um, ideals than they were in the 1990s. In the 1990s, the region was relatively homogenous in that respect, open to free trade, trying to insert itself in the international economy. And more recently, we're seeing that you know um, this has diversified considerably. Um, <clears throat> At the same time, additionally, the economic emergence of Latin American countries calls into question um, development cooperation as one of the key pillars of the bi-regional relationship as it's traditionally been. Maruk already mentioned that Latin America is increasingly less important as a, as a recipient um, of EU development cooperation, even though the EU to date remains the largest ODA donor to Latin America. Um, but Latin Americans now demand a different kind of cooperation. They don't want um, the EU um, as a sort of just a donor. They want a sort of eye-to-eye -eye partnership. Um, and in addition, Latin America now also has other outside options. The EU is no longer sort of the only alternative to the United States in Latin America's external, both political and economic relations. And Maruk has already discussed um, the rise of China um, as one of the most important aspects of that. And I would also like to mention the increasing importance of South-South cooperation in um, multilateral fora but also even in, um, in development cooperation, as some of the Latin American countries are emerging as donors of development assistance, such as Brazil and Mexico, um, they are increasingly turning to other um, emerging or developing nations as partners in that as well. So as a result, um, to summarize the scenario, the EU is less attractive for Latin America as a partner why Latin America should be more attractive to, for the European Union, but Europe is otherwise preoccupied with its own crisis, with global, with a, with global crises, and um, Latin America, to some extent, is also perceived as a kind of difficult partner because it now talks back. Um, in consequence, there's a certain fatigue of the bi-regional summit process um, and a fatigue with a bi-regional process in general that leads to a scenario of considerable uncertainty about the future of this process. Um, so now I'd like to ask the question, is all hope lost? Well, no, I don't think so. Um, by profession, I have to be an optimist about the, about the bi-regional relationship. Um, I think that the EU and Latin America and the Caribbean have a lot to say to each other, but what we need to change is we need to adapt the partnership um, to the needs of our time, and we need to be realistic about what this partnership can and cannot do. Um, so I'd like to make, um, I think, three key points in, in relation to this. Um, the first one is that not everything can or has to be discussed with everyone. Um, there's a considerable need to introduce an element of variable geometry in the bi-regional relationship between Latin America and the Caribbean. Maybe some countries are particularly interested in higher education, while others are particularly interested in migration, um, and we should allow for um, sufficient flexibility in the bi-regional process to allow such um, discussion in, in flexible formats. In practice, some of that is already happening. We can see, for instance, that in the bi-regional joint initiative on research and innovation, not all countries actively participate. The ones who do participate in the GRE meetings, as they're called, are those who have particular interest in cooperating um, bi-regionally on those issues. So not all countries need to be deeply involved in everything in order to be able to move forward. 
even though the process does need to be open to incorporate new actors at any time those countries might become interested in, in such cooperation. Um, my second key point would be that um, shared <coughs> values don't entail shared opinions. Um, as I mentioned previously, the process has relied a lot on, shared va on a rhetoric of shared values um, which sort of raises expectations that we're going to agree on, that, on those things as well, which I'm, I argue is not the case. Um, shared values mean that we can discuss many things that maybe we can't discuss with other regions so easily or in more depth but not that we're going to easily reach an agreement on all those questions as well. In fact, I'm, um, I think that it's basically arguing a little bit like with, within a family or with close friends. You can have the most heated arguments, but they also go into a lot of depth. Um, and we need to appreciate the value of those discussions and not see them as something which is, you know, annoying or an impediment to cooperation. It can be frustrating, but I think it's also a chance for the bi-regional relationship to innovate upon um, those shared values and really take them forward um, also, I think, at a global level. Um, and that takes me nicely to my third point, which is that what's been called the strategic bi-regional partnership is actually lacking a strategic dimension. Um, the question of where do we want to go together, where do we want to go together globally, is currently not really being asked. Um, and I think what the bi-regional relationship needs to do is rather than discussing um, this very vast amount of um, of issues is to also identify some global challenges um, that affect both regions and where both regions might have similar ideas about where the solutions might lie um, and try and work on, the, on them together and I think for instance one of the um, one of the aspects where that might work is um, the post-2015 um, international development framework that's currently under discussion. Um, and the two regions could um, talk together about how they want to move within that framework um, that's being established here. And I think another, another chance lies, at least to some extent, in the issue of climate change. Um, so the three suggestions that... Um, I might make for, for the bioregional relationship was that first we need to adjust expectations <coughs> about the relationship, we need to work flexibly together, and we need to get strategic. So, thank you. Thank you. Um, I think that uh, I would add uh, an element of complexity to, to what you just said, that Latin America is currently considering what to talk with whom uh, to different partners in, in the world because um, which parts of Latin America want to talk <coughs> what with with what regions of the world because there are new part there are new partnerships and new actors in the region like Russia and China getting together with the bloc that sometimes is called the Alba the Bolivarian uh, countries that follow you know socialism in the 21st century so is that uh, actually a, 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 a threat or, or an obstacle to deeper European uh, integration with Latin America because it creates complexities or is, is it really uh, making an incentive for Europe to try harder and try to deter these, these other alliances that Latin America is making? Uh, and perhaps in, in previous years, uh, Latin America didn't have um, a lot of uh, countries that could follow Europe on, on the global level, on the global issues, and now it has, but the issue is, are these countries ready to talk with, with Europe on these uh, on the, the matters that are more strategic to, to the world, like, for example, global security issues? So that is a good question. So we will open for questions now. I just, take off. Um, I just wanted to follow up on um, Maruk's point. I thought perhaps you were slightly skeptical about the Pacific Alliance um, and the sort of economic gains that can be gained from it. I wonder whether or not um, you know, the existence of competing blocks with um, different senses of purpose and different sort of economic models 
might actually provide an incentive towards greater integration, not just within the region, but um, more widely. Um, I mean, you take the example of the early 2000s about sort of pushing the ministry into competitive bilateralism, where you try to sort of get those who want to be on the front foot to make the greatest progress. But if you have it as compared to a situation in which you had, you know, everyone in the same tent, if you move at the pace of the slowest member, so for example, or something like that. So isn't there the potential through the specific alliance for such a sort of positively reinforcing dimension or dynamic to get reinforced? And isn't that the sort of the great potential of, of, of that main trend? Yes, I mean, that was exactly my point at the end, that ironically, while I don't see much for Europe with the Pacific Alliance directly, <laughs> what it can actually do is trigger a change in mindset in Mercosur. Mm. And that is, as I told you, know, one of the key, key partners for uh, uh, especially European companies. So on the economic side, Mercosur is very, very extremely uh, uh, irrelevant. The issue of the two speeds or sort of uh, using competing dynamics to egg both forward, uh, I think of course is part of the, uh, of the uh, response that the EU has made, an encouraging response to the Pacific Alliance, even though it actually goes against the EU's position on uh, uh, integration meaning more than just free trade. Uh, the sort of normative dimensions seem to miss, and yet it is willing to overlook that precisely because of that. But more importantly, the question of getting over the need to uh, keep Mercosur together. Although the EU would hate to be seen as the cause of Mercosur deciding to let uh, Argentina stay behind and Uruguay and Brazil especially go on and sign an association agreement with a two-speed sort of process and a sort of catching up process allowed to Argentina and Paraguay. The EU would hate to do that because of normative aspects. But of course, the, the economic pressures today are high and they are bowing to that. Alan. So, uh, thank you very much for your two, for two presentations. Um, what oh, sorry, can I suggest something? Since we're not really many people, could you introduce yourself? So yes, could you introduce yourself? I, <laughs> 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 I thought Antonio did that, sorry. <laughs> um, well, I'm um, the coordinator of the European Union Latin America and the Caribbean Foundation's EXPLORE program, which is a program for research and new developments. And the EU LAC Foundation is a foundation created by the bi-regional summit process um, in order to broaden the basis of that summit process and involve different kinds of actors more into the discussion on the bi-regional relationship. So we're tasked with um, liaising with academia, with economic actors, uh, with the media, um, and all different kinds of sectors in both regions and trying to bring them closer together. Um, yeah, well, I'm, my name is Alan Charles, and I'm a, um, a number of things. I'm a fellow of the uh, Latin American Studies, uh, which is probably most relevant. Um, I was wondering, uh, but thank you very much for your two presentations. Uh, you, know, you, you spoke because that was the uh, remit to about the EU and Latin America. But I do wonder, in practice, how important the EU as an institution is, as opposed to the member states, because you, you see the dynamic between um, uh, the uh, various member states and various member countries and their, inter and their interests is actually actually very strong. And um, of course, there's a big strategic point when you're thinking about Europe as a whole. When, and I might add, perhaps the most successful single state in punching of its way to Brazil is Norway, which is not a member of the EU. Um, um, you, you, see, you see, you see, there is a, obviously a big strategic point which you meant, meant made uh, at the beginning. I'm talking about that the, the EU is not the US. Obviously, the US is hugely important uh, and hugely attractive, but it also has many drawbacks and many of a baggage, historical baggage that the EU doesn't have. And clearly, the EU having an agreement with Mercosur would put it in a position which the US cannot reach because Mercosur, almost by definition, is a bloc which doesn't have a trade agreement with the United States. And that's the way it's developed historically. Um, so I, I, do, I do wonder, in the, in the dynamic of cooperation that you were talking about, um, yes, obviously the EU, to a degree, as an institution, reacts to the interests of member states. 
But um, I think it, uh, I, I wonder if you'd, you'd agree that it's important to look also at what cooperation is going on between um, the, the, the blocks in, the, in, uh, in, in, uh, in, in Latin America, but, but even more so between individual countries, particularly the, the larger and medium sized ones, and individual um, members uh, of the European Union, whether individual or, or, or in small groups, uh, and, and whether perhaps this adds up actually to rather more than the, the two of you might, might be suggesting. Yeah, um, I think how important is the EU vis-à-vis -vis its member states depends very much on which member state you're looking at. Well, let's take Germany, for example. I mean, Germany has huge trade with Latin America. Yeah. Uh, and um, uh, institutionally, it obviously is a very uh, a key member of the EU. But actually, in my estimation, uh, it basically follows its own interests in Latin America, rather than the um, To some extent... It does follow its own interests, but it's also actually one of the key member states in, fo in uh, shaping EU policy towards Latin America. So it's very much involved in, in both spheres. Um, and it's occasionally willing to accept um, some other members, EU member states' key interests in Latin America as well, where it, you know, where it can't oppose itself, be it sort of... French agricultural interests or, or, um, or some Spanish economic interests even as well. But I agree that there is an element of um, member states following their own interests over the EU in strategic instances, sort of um, fortunately for the bi-regional relationship in relation to Latin America, very strategic individual member state interests are far and few between. So Latin America is not one of the issues that um, strategically divides European Union member states. Um, I would I would say I would argue, and actually for some of the EU member states, um, the fact that the European Union is operating an active policy towards Latin America has meant that for the first time in a very long time, they've actually become involved with Latin America again, and I'm talking about the new Eastern member states. Um, they didn't have a policy towards Latin America to worth mentioning um, before their, their accession to the European Union, and then through um, the eu like bi-regional dialogue, they were forced to engage with this, and they're in increasingly starting to see um, Latin America as an interesting as an interesting region for them for their own economic interests. Um, so I would go as far as arguing that um, you know EU lack relations and member state Latin American relations um, can be very complementary. I think it's also important to think about uh, the, on the economic side, individual states and their companies very often very closely talk to each other, although they use the complementary EU framework because the EU, especially on trade matters, works at a multilateral and as a, as a group rather than an individual nation. But then you have but interesting... Not on trade promotion. Not on trade promotion, but on, uh, on uh, the framework, the, uh, the rules of the game, so to speak. Um, there is also the factor of the East European being a distraction in some way from Latin America for some of the states, and the, the East Europeans very often, on the one hand, learning to see new interests, but actually instinctively almost seeing Latin America as rivals, especially for investment. So let's say a German company thinking about you know, production chains Will it go towards Latin America? Will it go towards East Europe? For different reasons, of course, it will go uh, both ways even. But there is a competition within a firm. Who gets the resources? And that is very It's not a competition just between Eastern Europe and Latin America. No, it's global. Of course. So no yeah. It's a global connection. competition. Yeah. It is, uh, it is a global. There's there any connection with Eastern Europe. And I mean, don't think anyone in any German company out of net says, are we going to invest in Eastern Europe? Or it's, it's a global decision. Based on it's a global decision, exactly. As I said, we may in fact decide to invest in both places. Mm -hmm. I've done a lot of research on the automotive industry. Yeah. And this is a classic case where uh, the big, uh, especially German firms, but also French and other firms, uh, have made decisions that actually uh, uh, did 
have implications for one region or the other, either positively or negatively. For example, with the shrinking of the car market, who do you close? Do you close the Turkish factory, the Polish factory, or the Argentine factory? Actually, they aren't completely irrelevant to each other. Yeah, Hi, thanks. Um, my name is uh, Hervé. I'm a, I'm a research associate here at the Institute. I should probably correct this any question by saying that I'm not uh, an expert uh, by any means on, on Latin America. Um, but I thought that I would ask both, both speakers, actually, um, whether, coming back to this question of fatigue in the bi-regional relationship, whether it's fatigue with the relationship or fatigue with multilateralism, um, and not just uh, uh, among the Latin Americans, but in terms of the Europeans coming to expect too much out of what, on appearance, looks like uh, people they should be able to talk to. Uh, but uh, often these sort of top-down imposed regional forums or organizations uh, are meant to sort of superficially resemble the European Union, but don't have any of the normative embedding that you would see in Europe, and, and which were arguably the prerequisites for the success of uh, the European Union, and that's that's not uh, you know unique to, to South America or, or Latin America, but uh, but you see that everywhere. I mean, from from Africa to Southeast Asia, um, there's often this disappointment, high rhetoric, big expectations, and then and then you fall flat on your face because you realise that actually, and there's two telltale signs of that. One is the in the uh, multitude of organisations. So there's, as you say, you know, Europeans don't know who to talk to because there's so many competing platforms. Um, and then I was also stressed, the, I guess, from, from, from my very basic understanding of, of Latin America, the lack of ideological uh, hegemony, or not, not hegemony, but, but, but uh, unity in, 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 in the region as such, uh, which probably uh, precludes or inhibits um, the rise of, uh, uh, of a more inclusive, uh, respected, uh, um, a body that can speak for all. Um, so I was wondering whether you had further thoughts on that. I mean, on the diversity issue, uh, look at Europe itself. You know, it has it has taken a long time sure. to create even some kind of common sense. Uh, like, uh, I don't mean common sense, <laughs> but common sense yeah. of you know unity, yeah. identity. And that is one of the very hard things. On the one hand, Latin Americans feel that sort of brotherhood of Latin American type of identity. They're all hermanos to each other. But on the other hand, they, uh, there's the, the reality of competition or, or going back to uh, colonial times. And um, do we need necessary homogeneous political, let's say, ideologies or something? Not really. But we do need a sense of common, citizen-based, mm. uh, bottom-up rather than top-down identity. Yeah. And this I do see changing. In the 1990s, before this talk of regional groups and regional integration, uh, Brazilians thought of themselves as Brazilians and nothing else. Uh, uh, today, uh, and when you went to Brazil, you did not see, uh, I don't know, samba schools, of course, but you never saw tango schools. Today there's a tango school anywhere and everywhere you go, you know, Spanish language. All these interchanges at the citizen level, I think, is forming identities. Recently, I, uh, working with the USP people, so the University of Sao Paulo, they did a big elite um, survey, a very massive one, and they found that almost all Brazilian elites have something to say about their cultural and political and uh, identity related aspects about Mercosur and Latin America, less so for uh, other regions. So there's no sense of a multilateral identity, you know, or an interest in multilateralism in Brazil. Yeah. They're amongst the people, yeah. not so, of course, in the diplomacy. Interesting. So the, the other thing I was going to mention is that. Um, in Europe, there is the point was there's always incredibly dense proximity between populations. Yes, um, not so mm -hmm. in, which in is Latin what's, America. I mean, we, we had to one way or another you know, deal, deal with yeah. that, either through war yeah. or then, or then changing yeah. that proximity to an opportunity yeah. for yeah. regional I mean, we're 70 and years really later, that, and look at the European a, parliamentary yeah, elections. As you we were saying, the integration between the economies in Latin America um, isn't really existent. 
And the, uh, the, the, you know, which raises the question, is this even required? I mean, it, it looks good. It's probably nice to speak about if you're meeting uh, amongst presidents. Um, but, but is it an acquire, a requirement like it was a requirement for Europe because they had to somehow deal with each other uh, uh, and too often that led to war? Um, so I mean, that's, no, that's a larger, it, more philosophical... It, it follows a completely <laughs> different logic. Mm. Um, I mean, from my perspective, um, what it looks like is like the, in the European Union we discuss what we disagree on and then we hammer out a consensus whereas the Latin Americans to get together to talk about what they already agree on and exclude everything that they disagree <laughs> on from the dialogue. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, and also of course the logic of regional integration is completely different in the two yeah. regions. In the European Union um, economic integration was a way of dealing with um, what you mentioned, proximity and internal difficulties by a means other than war, um, whereas in Latin America it's supposed to serve an economic development purpose. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, so, you know, the logics are different and of course that leads to different, um, to different outcomes in terms of integration as well. I think we have time for one question. Philippi? Thank you, Antonio, and uh, thank you to uh, both panelists for, for two very interesting presentations. My name is Philippi Krauss, and I'm the President of the City of London. Um, picking up on the discussion that uh, Ambassador Alan Charlton uh, initiated, I asked the, the panel, um, what is your uh, view of uh, the um, of how the UK's uh, relationship with um, Latin America has evolved over the uh, recent years and how has that affected its position uh, within the EU on uh, EU Latin America relations? Um, the UK, yes, for a long time seemed to ignore Latin America, seemed to. And not necessarily because it always has very strong uh, trade, but more importantly, investment uh, in Latin America. Uh, more recently, however, and also there was a sense that um, the, uh, within the European Union, it was Spain and Portugal that would take the lead on relations with Latin America, just as uh, you know, um, uh, Britain would take uh, with the Commonwealth and so on. So there was this sort of sense of division of responsibility. But after the crash in 2000, or the crisis in 2008, and the especially hard hit uh, Spanish and Portuguese uh, companies as well as economy, uh, I think the uh, British have been more proactive, have in fact been uh, the few, amongst the few voices, pushing back at the very strong agricultural interests uh, that are, in a sense, blocking any move on the EU front. I think the British have, uh, you know, British government officials in the last, in, during this government, almost every couple of months there's some minister, some, somebody or the other, including the Prime Minister, visiting. Whereas the previous 10 years, there was maybe one visit. <laughs> so there's certainly the profile of Latin America has gone up. The, uh, the British especially uh, Brazil, but Latin America more generally, I think see opportunities for growth, uh, uh, especially uh, services uh, um, uh, uh, where the UK is very strong, trade and services, a very important thing, education sector, very important. So the, the British know they have a nice, on the one hand, a nice alternative to the United States, but still offer English uh, at the student level, and at the research level, uh, Britain has, of course, very competitive uh, uh, research and innovation from pharmaceuticals to, uh, you know, engineering. And this really makes an attractive partner. And it means jobs for the UK. Uh, and there's no historical baggage of dislike. So I think, you know, I mean, we can start with Brazil and football, can't we? Uh, the other day on television, they were showing the sort of shrine <laughs> to to the guy who brought, you know, football to to uh, to uh, Brazil, and all the little children, all the little boys kissing the the gravestone. You know, <laughs> it's sort of so symbolic and yet so important. 
we have time for just a little bit of time if you want to say something. Like that. Um, I mean, I don't really have anything to add. Um, over the last few years, we've seen a considerable rise in attention on behalf of the UK to um, to Latin America. Embassies have been reopened. Um, sort of travel diplomacy has increased considerably, and I think it's a very um, I think it's a very strategic approach. The UK consciously identifies certain issues where it has an interest with in working with Latin America, and then it goes and pursues those issues. And I think almost it might be good if the British example would sort of um, set the lead for wider EU engagement with a region where you, you, you know, you set yourself strategic goals for the cooperation and then you go and pursue them rather than getting stuck in a sort of um, fluffy pink clouds rhetoric of, you know, we, we share values and the world is beautiful sort of thing. <laughs> well, Thank you very much. I think we've seen two uh, very uh, important developments uh, this year on uh, EU-Latin American relations, which were the apparent advances in the, the trade negotiations between Mercosur and the EU, and the cybersecurity issue, which yes. perhaps is a topic for a, for a future event between Germany and Brazil, which is arguably uh, an important strategic step in the, in the, in the partnership. So um, we'll keep watching that front. Thank you very much for coming.